All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to our morning devotions. This is episode 125 out of Judges chapter 14. And um, for those that have gathered with us this morning, I, I trust that uh, this will be a blessing to you. I, I hope perhaps a little enlightening. Uh, it's it's amazing what we read here in this in this chapter. Uh, it's all about this wedding that uh, is supposed to be go ongoing. That Samson desires this Philistine woman. The parents object. Of course, they'd object. He says, I really want her. Even dad goes down and makes the arrangements uh, to marry this woman. And on the way, uh, he kills a lion with his bare hands. There's the riddle of the honey inside the carcass. He's a Nazarite. He's not supposed to touch anything that's dead. He kills it. So he, he's got a dead animal in his hands. And then he eats the honey out of a dead carcass. He doesn't tell his folks he's done this. Um, he goes to the wedding. Now, the, the key to this, folks, and there's more. I'm just giving you the outline here. The key to this is this wedding uh, celebration is seven days long. And when you read some of the commentators, oftentimes the men and the women were separated at these things. As far as you can tell, there's nothing in this text that says that this uh, wedding was ever consummated. I think that's the first thing, all right? It's not that it's not in his heart to marry her because he really wants to, but it never happens. In the end, the Philistine dad, because this is a Philistine wedding, not an Israeli wedding. Okay, so it's a, it's a Philistine wedding that, as far as the text is concerned, is never consummated. And because they're so mad that he kills 30 guys in Escalon just for their clothes, that the father says, you can't marry him. And he gives his daughter, the bride, to Samson's best man. <laughs> so there, in a nutshell, is what we're looking at here. But I just want you to note a few things. Because uh, right here in the beginning, uh, this is the verse everybody skips over. And when I start talking about the verses the pastors skip over, this is the one. And, and this is the one they cannot skip over. It's right here in chapter 14 uh, when it comes down to um, verse 4. Because he says, I want this Philistine woman. And they're saying, well, isn't there, aren't there any Israeli women here in the, in the tribe of Dan? And he presses uh, his dad. Uh, there is some, some interesting points on how he's still kind of yielding to his dad. And how after this all goes through, his dad is down in Philistine country making these arrangements. But it says this in verse 4. But his father and his mother knew not. Listen to this. But his father and his mother knew not that it was the Lord. Here is the antecedent, L-O-R-D, Jehovah, that he, Jehovah, saw an occasion against the Philistines. God has a plan to wipe out the Philistines. The word occasion in the Hebrew is a hapax legomenon. For those that know me, a hapax legomenon is the word that's only in the Bible once. This is only in the Hebrew once. And uh, essentially what it means is, of all the things, it's just looking for the right time, but within this context, the men give it the rendering, looking for a quarrel, looking for a fight. And that's why I entitled this, Picking a Fight, and I didn't include Jehovah in here. But what we're looking at here is God has him in place, Samson in place, and this is the means, looking for an occasion for Samson to go down and pick a fight with this marvelous strength that he has with the Philistines. That is what we're looking at here. And uh, the commentators go everywhere here, but essentially God uses the good and the bad because he should not be down here with these Philistines in this social capacity at all. And the fact is, however, he never actually consummates this. This is just a desire of his heart. But the whole idea here, the focus of this that overrides all these other objections that all have to be filtered through this is this is God's divine plan to use Samson to pick a fight, an occasion against the Philistines. He says, sought an occasion against the Philistines. And we draw the word occasion here because it's only in the Bible once. We don't have anything to cross-reference it with. That what we're looking at is we're looking for a way to kill Philistines, which is what he is supposed to be doing. Now, if you focused on that, or if they, and I'm only hitting the high points here. Everybody, if you have any questions about that, can look at it in more detail yourself. But the whole idea here is God is going to use him now as an instrument to kill Philistines. And even the commentators that know that he shouldn't be down here with the Philistine women, which as far as I, let me say it again, there's never any consummation of this. 
because they're all, this whole thing happens over a seven day period, uh, which is just the wedding celebration before they're actually it's done and then they're on their own. Um, this this whole idea they they even say uh, when it comes to this uh, seeking occasion against the Philistines um, that um, oh man it just slipped my mind um, that uh, this was what was I gonna say oh, I'm sorry about that um, I had another thought and it was piling on top of another thought um, I'll come back to it um, this whole idea was. Yeah, I can't remember. Sorry about that. Um, um, I'll, I'll get it. Anyway, um, so he's seeking an occasion against the Philistines. All right. So let's just start there. That, that oh, I know. The whole idea was that God uses everything to get his work done. He uses imperfect things to get his work done. And I've said that before. Here we see that as well that it the god does not use perfect vessels and and we can measure this differently and the reason everybody gets worried about this one is because it has to deal with a woman and a man and how he should not be in this in this arena uh at all and and i understand how the new testament guys or the guys of the church right now don't want to get into this because we would say from a new testament sense this is an unequal yoke but no nobody can use this passage for that because nobody uh, assigns uh, God does not assign to us uh, in this tech in, in the time in which we live this kind of capacity all right he told Hosea to marry a, har a harlot all right um, that's all under God's purview but here uh, he's going to use this woman to get uh, get God's word work done so let's press on here uh, let's see let's go down to verse 10 because um, uh, oh no I got to get I got to hit this uh, in verse 6, while he's going down to the Philistine territory, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Can you hear that? I, those are some of our finest jet fighters because there's an Air Force base not far from here that fly over my mom's place. And they are uh, amazing to watch. They fly in formation, and they're not that high. And they are some of the advanced fighters of the United States. And when they fly over the house, I say that like that's the sound of freedom. So if you if you, you hear that in the background, that's what that is. These are these F-22s or F-23s, some of the finest fighters that the United States Air Force has. But they fly circuits around here all day and night. So anyway, that's what that was. In verse, uh, in verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. That is this lion. And when Samson went down and his father and his mother to, the, to Timnath uh, and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And here's, here's what we see happens. The Spirit of the Lord falls upon him as if uh, Samson is cloaked in the power of the Spirit. And he says, and he rent him as he would have rent a uh, kid. That is, with his bare hands, he kills this lion. He tears him to shreds with his bare hands. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father and his mother what he had done. And uh, that's that's the first time we see uh, in this story the power of Samson. He kills this lion uh, with his bare hands. And then he goes down uh, in verse 9. Uh, let's look at verse 8. And after a time he returned to take her and returned in aside to see the carcass of the lion. Behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. <laughs> All right, because that's what bees do. It says, and he took thereof in, in his hands and went on eating um, and came to his father and mother, and he gave them, and they did eat. But he told them not that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion because that would be unclean. <laughs> I mean, it's a dead animal. You're not supposed to do this. But Samson says, hey, it's good. He has some. He takes it home. Doesn't tell anybody where it came from. But this is this happens because you have to have this riddle, all right, that Samson is going to do with all these Philistines, all right. Uh, he goes on, um, and it says, And his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, and, and so used the young men to do. This is, this is what everybody did. And it's verse 10 that I wanted you to note that his father went down unto the woman. This is to his bride to make all these arrangements. He's in on this, all right. Uh, this is Manoah. And uh, it says, And it came to pass when they saw him that they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, if ye can certainly declare it 
uh, me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 change of garment garments. Man, this is big. Everybody's going to get a new suit. Um, uh, but he could not declare it. Uh, but he, ye cannot declare at me, uh, and, excuse me, but if ye cannot declare at me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty chains of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle, that we may hear it. So, thirty changes of clothing. I'm going to give all of you one, but you're going to give me thirty. <laughs> so he goes like this. Uh, he says, um, uh, and this is the riddle, verse 14. Uh, and he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat. Out of the eater came forth meat. So out of the line comes the honey. And out of the strong came forth sweetness. This is the riddle. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. So they could not figure it out for the first three days of the, of the, uh, of the wedding feast, uh, of this, the celebration that they're having. Uh, and actually, it, it goes beyond that, but this is for three days they're still trying to figure it out, but they escalate the issue when you see what's going to happen here. So they could not figure it out on their own. And then it says, and it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, but you'll note here that this has been going on longer as we read later. He says, entice thy husband that thou may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. And ye called us, have ye called us to take uh, that we have? Is it not so? Have, did you come here to rob us? Here's the way the Philistines deal with things. Listen, lady, if you don't tell us the riddle, squeeze it out of your husband. We're going to burn you and your family. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the Philistine Empire. All right, this this is what they're saying to her. Now, so what is she going to do? And that's what we're going to read following here. It says, and Samson's wife wept before him and said, thou dost but hate me. Sounds like Delilah. See, there's parallels here. Um, and lovest me not. You don't love me. You won't tell me. If you love me, you'll tell me. He said, uh, Thou hast put forth a riddle uh, unto uh, the children of my people and hast not told it me. You told them, but you won't. You, you haven't told them, but you, you haven't told me either. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father or my mother, and shall I tell thee? I haven't told anybody, is what he said. <laughs> Why should I tell you? <laughs> no. And then it presses on. And she wept before him the seven days. See, there's the point. For the seven days, and the word wept before him right here, uh, while, they fe while the feast lasted, the idea here is that she's hanging about his neck just crying. Why? Because they're going to burn her place down and her. So she's begging. Can you imagine at a wedding ceremony? I, I, was at, I had a wedding once. I officiated at a wedding once, had a part in it. And while I'm standing up there with a the pastor, they wanted me to give the invocation, and the pastor that was standing next to me did did the vows. We're watching these this couple down, come down the aisle, and she, you know, sometimes brides cry. I mean, it's emotional time. Not a big deal. When she's walking down the aisle, she is weeping. She is, like, crying. Like, I'm looking at the pastor. He's looking at me like, should we go ahead with this? Like, does somebody have, a like, a shotgun aimed at her? So get down the aisle, you know? It was not comfortable. It was she was crying too hard <laughs> for me, uh, and I had not done any of the counseling. I was just having a part in the wedding, and I'm going, man, oh man, if I were just to read her face and her her countenance and the way she's handling herself, I would say, man, this is this should not happen. So, and actually, I, I still remember it because it had such an impact on me that I was wondering, I mean, what I'm supposed to pray because this is supposed to be a happy time, but not a happy time that is that is drenched in tears. There can be tears, but not like, whoa, what is that? Anyway, I gave the invocation. I was all wrong about the whole thing, and they've been married, I don't know, it's been years now, okay? But when she's coming down the aisle, she's, she's really crying. And this was what happened here. All during the celebration, she's just after him, and she's weeping. <laughs> like, everybody's saying, man, should should we go forward with this? It might should have been maybe a hint to Samson, right? Listen, I mentioned the hint to Samson, but the commentators all talk that way. There's so many things here in this story that should have pointed him the other way. But because he really loved her here in the first three verses of the chapter, he just presses on. He presses on right to the end until it comes to verse 20. And then we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, let me see. Let's keep going here. He said uh, in verse 17, and she wept before him the seven days. Well, their feast lasted and it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her. He told her, and this is what Samson did with Delilah. You can cut my hair. He says, I'm going to tell you the riddle. Uh, 
that he told her because she lay sore upon him. And she told the riddle to the children of her people. And there you go. If you're going to keep a secret, you don't tell anybody. Never tell a soul. I talk about confidence keeping means you have to keep your promise and never tell anybody till you're dead. That's what it means to keep a promise, keep a confidence. Hardly anybody can do it. Um, that should be one of the strong suits of a pastor. He should be able to hear things of the most delicate nature and keep it a confidence. It only goes into his head and never goes anywhere else. And Samson, I mean, he she's after him to tell. And finally he does, all right? Um, so it says, verse 18, And the man in the city said unto him on the seventh day, because that's the deal. In the seventh days, you got to come up with a solution. He says, In the seventh day before the sun went down, they're right at the end of the end. What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? They answered the riddle. And here's Samson, he says, And he said unto them, If he had not plowed with my heifer, I'm not going to say anything about that because this is just a metaphor. But the metaphor for us is perhaps humorous, right? If you have not plowed with my heifer. But we have to be careful about these Old Testament metaphors because in Song of Solomon, the Shulamite, who is this beautiful woman that he, he, he's in love with, is compared to the, to the, the horses in, in, uh, in uh, Pharaoh's, uh, that draw Pharaoh's chariots. Because at that time, they were the most powerful, elegant, beautiful creatures. I mean, these horses, so he could get compared to that. And here, there we're using another metaphor, which we would not use. But the whole idea is, if you, if you, had, not, if you had not gone after my wife, someone that, that, um, that is going to be mine, all right, then you'd never found out. If he had not plowed with my heifer, he had not found out my riddle, which is true. But they did. That's the point. And then it says this. This is another great passage because so far all he's killed is a lion, but now he's got to get in the business of what he's there for because remember, it says the Lord sought an occasion against the Philistines. Well, so far no Philistines are dead because that's what he's supposed to do in chapter 14. He hasn't killed anybody yet. So he, he's not doing his work yet. But here we're right at the end of the wedding ceremony. Uh, God saw, sought an occasion or was wanted to pick a fight with the Philistines. And now here we are. She told the riddle. All of this is unfolding in the providence of God. This is all by God's design. See, the, when I say providence, most people think of providence, and we have to write about this because we don't talk about this way, although the old timers did all the time. Providence is good and bad. God is behind the good and the bad because the good and the bad both contribute to his final perfect will. Everything does is providential. Everything is providential. Some things are providential for us to embrace. That is to say, this is the will of God as it's unfolding in history. And some things in providence are there for us to reject because our, our principal reason for deciding on things is not providence. It is the word of God. We look at providence as it's unfolding, and then we align it with the word of God. If providence is consistent with what the word of God teaches, then we align ourselves with what's happening in history. If providence is against what we see out there is happening, that's happening is against the truth of God's word, then we do not embrace it. Providence is not our governing factor. The word of God is our governing factor. And that's very, very important to remember. Because if you let providence be your governing factor, do you think God's hand is in everything? The, the last people that believed that and, and was written about were the, is the German Evangelical Lutheran Church who said Hitler was there by the providence of God and because they misunderstood providence, they followed Hitler as if he was God's man for the nation while he's going about the eradication of the Jewish nation. I mean, this is what happens if you let providence get ahead of the truth of God's word. I, that's a little, far, a little distant off, but uh, what we're looking at here is the unfolding of God's will, which is to what? Kill Philistines. That's what he's there for. So finally, we're down to what this is all about. In verse 19, I want you to note this. So far, I haven't seen anything in here except uh, his attention to a, uh, which should not have been there. I'll, I'll give you that. Towards a woman that is a Philistine and not an Israeli because it's against the law to marry. You're not supposed to marry somebody that's a Gentile. So he's outside the scope of that. I'll give you that. But other than that, 
we, there hasn't been consummation. There hasn't been thou shalt not commit adultery. Nothing has happened here. I mean, his parents are involved in this whole wedding celebration. Um, uh, okay, and he shouldn't, he's a Nazarite, so he shouldn't eat from a, a, the, the carcass of a, a dead animal. But I want you to remember, as a Nazarite, he's going to be holding dead things all the time. I want you just to think that because he is a killer of Philistines. All right, when, it's, when the Nazarite's not supposed to touch a dead body, everyone that he kills, he's got in his hand, is dead. All right, he's in the midst of death. So I want you to take that into consideration as well as we balance the fact that he's a Matt Nazarite and what Nazarites are supposed to do. And within the law, not just Nazarites, about not touching dead bodies and being unclean and his commission. We just got to balance all of this. All right, so here we are, down to verse 19. It says this, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, same as with the lion. So the Holy Spirit, like a cloak, covers him. He's working now in the strength of the Holy Spirit, the strength of God Almighty. I want that just to sink in for all the those that have problems with this chapter. God is doing this through him. God's plan was to pick a fight, to seek an occasion against the Philistines. God is had he did pick a fight with the Philistines through this riddle. And the result of this is the Spirit of God comes on Samson, and Samson now is going to do what he is called to do. And it's here in verse 19. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, which is one of those big Philistine cities. So he's, he's right in one of the cities. He goes to the New York of the Philistine Empire. That's where he is, in Ashkelon. And slew 30 men. <laughs> He found 30 guys. He's looking around. I wonder if he said, I, I like that outfit. I like that outfit. Who's got the nicest stuff before he killed them? He kills 30 Philistines. He says, he took their, and took their spoil. That is, he took their money, whatever they had, okay, spoil, whatever it was. I mean, he took that. He says, and gave change of garments uh, unto them that expounded the riddle. Um, so, I mean, I, I should have looked at that closer, but it says he took their spoil. So the only thing that was in the deal was the garment. So the spoil, it, it looks like here, and I, I could be corrected. I have to look. It looks like it just went to him, <laughs> to Samson. I mean, there's a benefit in, in killing Philistines as an Israeli. He says, uh, and gave change of garments unto them that expounded the riddle. And this is what happens. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. He's, he, he, this whole idea that he had to do all this, this was not the plan. Because in his heart, he loves her. That's, that's behind all of this, okay? We don't see any change in this uh, from the first three verses where he says, I want, a, I want this woman. Uh, the point is, he do doesn't ever get her. And then it says this in verse 20. But Samson's wife was given to his companion, and the word companion here. Uh, in our vernacular, it would be the best man, <laughs> his best man, his best buddy. She gets the wife. And all the commentators, they all have a common voice on this. That is, this is because this is not an Israeli wedding. Samson's down here in, a, in an Israeli town with, with Israeli friends and Israeli, I mean, excuse me. He's in a Philistine town with Philistine friends in a Philistine wedding. And after he kills off these 30 guys to get their clothes, nobody, nobody's happy about it. And so the father of the bride here gives his bride-to-be, all right, after seven days of celebration, to the best man. <laughs> and Samson goes home with nothing, except maybe, maybe the spoil, if he didn't give the spoil to the guys, all right? All I'm saying is, I think the Word of God is a wonderful thing to read. And I think the closer we read it, the more refreshing it is. And, and we get a more balanced approach to things. And there's so many things to factor in here, uh, rather than just taking this as a template from Judges chapter 14, bring it into the New Testament, and then try to make a case here for being not unequally yoked together. All right? Because Samson, like all the judges, they have a unique purpose and his purpose is to kill, kill, uh, kill Philistines. So let's just put the bookends on this. The bookends are, in verse 4, and he sought occasion against the Philistines. Oh, excuse me. Uh, but his father and his mother knew not that it was uh, of the Lord that he's pursuing this, is, uh, this uh, Philistine woman. 
that's tough, isn't it? It's of the Lord that he's fallen in love with a Philistine woman. Why? That he saw an occasion against the Philistines. This is the way in to, to take the fight to the Philistines. That's what this is all about. Chapter 14. The rest of it is the story about how all that unfolds under the providence of God until you get to verse 19 where he actually kills 30 guys, takes their garments, and goes home and the wife that he was supposed to, that he was in love with, uh, which is the complication here, he never marries anyway. <laughs> Welcome to the book of Judges. All right, that's it for this morning. Listen, if you have any comment about that, I would love to hear it. I really would. So, um, uh, it's it's just a marvelous thing. It's marvelous because, um, and he, he's going to go. He's going to be in trouble with ladies in in the next chapter as well. Um, it's Delilah that's finally going to get the best of him uh, when he's going to tell the secret of what he is as a Nazarite. I mean, this substantive thing. All right. Well, the Lord bless you. You have a great day. What is this? Just Tuesday? Still in Arizona. And uh, it's supposed to be close to 80 today. So for all those that are back in Virginia and up in Michigan, uh, I just want to let everybody know that it's really nice here. So <laughs> I, I know I'm being bad. All right. Well, the Lord bless you all. And uh, have a great day. And uh, Lord willing, I'll see everybody tomorrow for more of Samson. Okay, we'll see you. Bye.